Uh, Jeff, you ready to talk some puck? I am. All right, let's bring on NHL reporter for ESPN, Emily Kaplan. Emily, thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure. How are you guys? We are fantastic. Other than checking the flyer score right now, we're just not going to look at that. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But Jeff's, Jeff's got something he wants to start with that's much more important than sports. Yes, Emily. So you are also a North Jersey person like myself. And before we get to your story in hockey, I got to ask, how does someone become a self-professed bagel snob? Expert, um, yeah. Someone becomes, yeah, a self-professed bagel snob when they grew up in New Jersey where there's great bagels, but lives in uh, Chicago now where everything is just garbage in my mind. So uh, everyone tries to get me to eat bagels here. I think they're no good. And that's how I'm a bagel snob. All right. So then I got a question for you. Where are the best bagels outside of New York and New Jersey? Uh, probably Montreal. Like they're a different style, but they're really good if you've ever had a Montreal bagel. We, we had this discussion before we went on air. I went to Montreal and I said to Jason, I'm telling you, in Montreal, they have good bagels. He's like, You're, you must be kidding. See, I told you, Montreal is the place for bagels. He just made Jeff's day because uh, <laughs> he, was, he was ranting about that a little bit before the show. You're a, a local person from Montclair, as we said. You went to Penn State. Uh, you're also a member of the team that, that writes the Monday Morning Quarterback. What was that like for you to be involved in? Yeah, it was a really cool experience working with Peter King just to see, um, you know, how he operates. He files a monster of a column every Monday, and he talks to, you know, 10 influential coaches and players every Sunday night at like 2 a.m. So just to watch his work ethic and, you know, travel the country, which seems like a really long time ago, uh, but freely travel the country covering football and interesting characters. It was a really great career experience. Emily, you, you yourself had a great work ethic from an early age. You wrote for your hometown paper as a teenager. How did you get the bug to be a, a sports reporter? Um, you know, I wanted to do this since I was very young. Uh, it was one of those things that, like, I was six years old, and I said, I'm going to be a sports reporter because I love writing and I love sports and I'm really bad at math. So it was always my goal. I went to Penn State because they specifically had a sports journalism program, and uh, that's where it went. What has this been like to cover for you? Obviously, the NHL is in the bubble right now. Uh, as a fan, I'm watching, seeing some spectacular hockey. Uh, as a reporter, how is it to get access to news and information and, and to cover this in a different time? Um, you know, it's definitely been an adjustment. And, you know, I, I think I took for granted just how easy my job could be when I could walk into an arena and anyone I wanted to talk to was right in front of me. And, you know, I think this has really tested a lot of relationships, you know, now we're so reliant on phone calls and texts and people getting back to us. And it was all that legwork the last, you know, couple of years that is paying off now or not paying off now. So, um, and you also just miss the human interactions. Like you can have a much more nuanced conversation with someone when it's in person um, and just being there at the rink, um, you know, just being in the energy, witnessing things. Um, being at practice. So it's very clear that I miss it, but uh, I think we're all just adapting to new realities right now. Well, for us, we are, even though it's for nothing now, so oh. Jason, do not look anymore. Um, it's for That's nothing. I'm able to watch four games because I'm not the reason that they were losing because <laughs> I turned it off. But bef prior to this game, uh, the Flyers have played incredibly well and their young goalie Carter Hart has, has been nothing short of excellent. Uh, what are you hearing from people in the bubble about the Flyers and their chances of moving forward and, and what their prospects look like in the future? You know, I think this is a team that really surprised a lot of people from January on. They had the best record in the NHL, but when they got to the bubble, everyone kind of expected, oh, well, the Bruins or the Penguins or the Capitals, you know, shine through and the Flyers are still a couple of years away. But with the way they started in that round robin in the first game against Montreal, not so much today, um, I, I think they really turned a lot of heads that this is a team um, that is in championship mode right now and could make it quite far. What's the feeling about some of the young players? Obviously, you know, we, we say Carter Hart, but Ivan Provorov is playing such a substantial role. Now you've got Joel Farabee up here. Some of the, the names that we've heard as fans in the system for years are now up here making a difference in a playoff run. Uh, what's the talk of, of the future of the team that they're seeing on the ice right now? Yeah, it's so bright. And, you know, I think that some credit does need to go to the former GM, Ron Hextall, because these are all prospects that he drafted. He was just really patient and didn't want to call them up soon enough. Um, you mentioned Farabee. He's got a couple goals in this tournament already. But like Ivan Provorov is 
and Travis Sanheim, both of them on defense um, have just been a revelation. I think people are looking at them now like true one, number one defenseman in the league, number two defenseman in the league type status. And the future is so bright for them because all of these guys are really, really early on in their career and have a lot of hockey ahead of them. I did want to ask after the, the first game, the head coach for Montreal uh, was taken to the hospital with chest pains. Looks like he's going to be out for the series. Uh, any update on what's going on there? Yeah, it's a scary situation. He had chest pains, but um, he got a stent um, at the hospital, and he returned home, like you said, to rest. Um, honestly, it's a stressful time. Who knows if it was a pre-existing condition? Who knows if it was the environment? Um, but I do think it was the right call just to remove him from the team, let him go back to his family and recover, um, because they have a very capable assistant coach, as you guys see. Uh, he's leading this team to quite the win, uh, Kirk Muller. Um, and he's definitely offensive minded. And, and it's interesting that you're seeing his style already translate in this first game behind the bench. You talked about it being possibly being a stressful time in the bubble. What are you hearing from the players as to how they're dealing with it, how they're blowing off steam when they're not playing games? You know, there's not that much to do, but I think as so far, everyone has kind of kept their head up high. You know, nothing is ideal. Um, but everyone knows that the NHL is doing the best they can. But, you know, in the Toronto bubble, for example, they have access to the Major League Soccer field. They can go throw a football around there, play spike ball is very popular. This uh, simulated golf uh, that guys can play, it's like a simulated driving range or a ping pong. So they're just doing little things to keep themselves busy. We've yeah, seen- what could you possibly do in Edmonton to keep yourself busy? <laughs> uh, there's golf. They can, they're going to take them out to some golf trips soon. Well, they'll enjoy that. We, we've on the ice. We've seen some spectacular hockey. I mean, the other day you had a game start at three oh nine in the afternoon, and five overtimes later, it ended six hours later, uh, setting a record for eighty five saves in a game. What was the NHL's thought of of that game, which forced games to be moved around to the next day? Yeah, I think it's just what I was talking about earlier. Everyone is just adapting, but. This is why we love playoff hockey. It's so unpredictable. It's so exciting. Everyone's putting their all in, and that five-overtime game was just a gruel. But what was even more impressive to me was the way they all bounced back for game two, especially Columbus, which lost and put up a really good performance. How does the NHL feel about their bubble right now? They've they've had zero positive tests. I I don't know if they could have painted a better scenario uh, from a fan perspective, to me, that the telecast and broadcast is is flawless. The sound, the the look of the arena. Is the NHL satisfied with with what they're doing and what they're getting out of what they put in? They are. Um, you know, like you said, the broadcast looks great, and they've had a really so far successful time um, keeping health and safety protocols at a very elite level. And it's clear that they put a lot of thought, a lot of planning, a lot of money into this tournament. I think one thing no one's talking about is it's very expensive to stage this, millions of dollars in corona tests alone. Um, But they do feel confident. I think everyone's just knocking on wood, hoping that they can, uh, you know, complete this thing at the same pace. From what you've seen of all the teams that are still in the bubble, um, who do you think is going to be the one that comes out of this? (laughs) I honestly have zero idea. I, I, I literally couldn't give you an answer. That's a good duck, Jeff. That's, I mean, that's almost as good as Kevin Casey changing the topic after he asked the first question in that interview. Uh, I did want to ask you a little bit. What was the league reaction after the Rangers won the draft lottery? Fans obviously complaining if they're not a Rangers fan. Uh, what was the reaction to them uh, walking away with the first pick? You know, Gary Bettman would never say it out loud, but this is good for the league. Um, you know, at a time when they're losing a lot of money um, or, or competing against a lot of different entities for people's dollars, um, when their big market teams are relevant, it's very good for the league and the league prospers. So I think this was the right time for that to happen. Um, and I think Gary Bettman was probably pretty happy, even if he would never admit it. So, Emily, how much are you enjoying doing your podcast? For people that don't know, I she's do doing it on ice. Yeah, no, I do it with Greg Wyshynski, and it's just, um, we're a great team together. Uh, it's just the two of us kind of manning the ESPN coverage, and I love chatting with him, and we love bringing in guests and having conversations like this. All right, on, on ESPN's website, if people haven't seen, Emily is wearing a Quebec Nordiques jersey. Is there a story? Yeah, that's one of those. <laughs> um, there's literally no story to it. We were taking the photos that day. My editor said he had it in his trunk, very questionable. And I said, that would be fun. If Greg can wear a devil's jersey, then I'll wear this. There you go. Uh, how can people follow if you? They want to stay up to the latest news on Twitter. Obviously, they can read your stuff on ESPN. How can they stay updated on your latest news? 
Yeah, um, I would say go to ESPN.com slash NHL. I know it's annoying the tab's not on the homepage, but there's a lot of good stuff there. And, uh, yeah, I'm on Twitter at Emily M. Kaplan. But I really appreciate the conversation, guys. This was fun. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate the time and look forward to seeing your coverage as we go forward. And we'll try to send you some uh-huh. bagels. Yeah. We'll be <laughs> I have plenty in my freezer, trust me. But I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Thanks for the time. Have a great one. Bye.